Dr. Karen Hillsprun, and you have reached another episode of Leadership is Served and Community. I am so excited about our guest today. We have one of the sister 2022 Sister Leaders Conference, one of the destiny bound speakers, and you know they are top tier. They are the, they're operating in their lane of brilliance in this world. And so today we have Dr. Erica Sheffield. And so Dr. Erica, if you could tell the community, just give us a brief intro and then we'll be able to dive deep in everything that you're doing here on this earth. Okay, awesome. My name is Dr. Erica Sheffield. I am the CEO and founder of Anchor to Teach <clears throat> LLC which was actually launched with the sole purpose of providing professional development opportunities for educators across the world. I've actually started it. This business is actually based out of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and where I'm actually involved in a particular school district not far from my hometown, and where I provide professional development, go in and work with the teachers, along with also provide support in the classroom, which is very, very, very rewarding. I have been an educator for over 25 years, and um, I also work for the University of West Alabama part-time as a professor for online programs, as well as I'm also the ADA compliance um, officer for online programs. Awesome. Awesome. So tell me why education? Tell me a little bit about how you found, how education found you, or did you find it? Why education? Back in the day, I'm originally from Mobile, Alabama, and back in the day, I had a, my positive role model was actually a family friend, um, Dr. Connie Giles, and she worked at MARC, which is the Mobile Association for Retarded Citizens, and that's how I got my, my start in special education, because that is something that's very near and dear to my heart. So after I started working at MARC, I decided to go back and pursue um, an alternate um, certificate for my master's in special education because my bachelor's is actually in psychology. So with doing that, I fell in love with working with um, students with special needs and those profoundly disabled students at that time. And then from there, I actually transitioned to um, uh, the actual school district in Mobile County and worked there for nine years before I actually transitioned to the University of West Alabama and worked there for 15 years and then decided to open my own business because I wanted to give back because I feel that there is such a, a, a dear need for ensuring that special education teachers stay in the field, but then, then that we're also giving them what they need in order for them to be successful. I love that. And just full disclosure here. So my mom is a retired special education teacher of 36 years. And so she, um, and actually she only retired one year and then she went back and started working in Head Start because I guess she don't know how to retire. So she's back in the workforce now, but I grew up around, um, the special education community. I mean, my mom taught severely and profoundly. I, at that time, the word, I'm sure there's a different word now, but it was severely and profoundly handicapped and emotionally disturbed. Um, and then through later, the latter part of her career when she couldn't um, lift because some of her, her, her students, he had to lift and different things with the help of an assistant. She moved into reading being a reading specialist in special education. And sometimes throughout her career, her goal was to just teach some students life skills, um, you know, so that they can possibly live independently or live as close to independently as they could. And so I am very familiar with this and love the special education community because my mom, as she refers to them as her babies, these That's are my right. babies. And we had a whole room in our house that had all types of resources that she used and bought with her own money so that she can help her babies in whatever way that she could. And so you already have a fan. You already have a fan because I love, love, love the community that you serve. 
And so I did a little research on you. And so I want to talk to you about what I found that you do out there in social media. And so one of a uh, topic that, um, well, actually I found a quote that you made and I want you to tell me about it. You said, I am a firm believer that education is the foundation for every profession. Expound on that for me. Dr. Karen, I am definitely a firm believer that that is the case because when you think about it, no one can actually go into a career without having the education. For the most part, everyone has to go through the educational sector and that's with higher ed, whether you're getting a trade or you're actually um, and pursuing a bachelor's degree or master's degree or even an EDS or, or doctoral degree. But you have to have a level of education. That's with any profession. So that's that's where I got that from. <laughs> I love that. And out of all the disciplines that one can pick in education, why, why special ed for you? Tell me about that journey. Um, I, I love... I guess, I guess even with my rearing as a child, um, I actually went to several of the Catholic schools in Mobile County. And I don't know, I guess it's just my, my character, just my personal traits. When it comes to, I always tend to want to gravitate towards the underdog um, or someone that's not seen as being normal. Even to the point where there was a best friend of mine in uh, grade school, as a matter of fact, and kids used to bully her and pick on her and things of that nature. And she moved to Mobile from Indiana. And it was where I was like, they really shouldn't pick on her like that. And so I took her under my wing and we became best of friends. And, and it was from there that when I was awarded the opportunity to teach at Mobile um, Association for Retarded Citizens, that I was like, you know, I really, I really love working with these kids. And then I also have a personal connection as well because of the fact that uh, I had a, a child back in 2010, her name was Jimmy, and I had her early. So she was premature. Well, she only lived for seven weeks. And I knew then, I was like, the Lord has, he's already trained me. And I knew I was going to be a, an exceptional mom in that regard because I had the proper training needed in order to give Demi what she needed. So I, I love, when I say I have a genuine interest and just a passion for special needs children, I really do. I love hearing you say that. And I love hearing about the personal connection that's associated with the, with the, um, your connection with the industry. A lot of times I, try to dig deep and find out what is the personal connection because most times there is a personal connection. Sometimes it may not be direct, it may be indirect, but it may be something that caused you to look further, uh, find your purpose or choose, you know, this particular industry over this particular industry. You know, I'm, I'm in leadership and I'm in leadership. My personal connection is when I was a middle manager who wanted to be in leadership, I could not find anyone to mentor me. So now I'm in female senior leadership because of that pain point in my life. Well, I had to go through a process to find a mentor because one is so few senior leader women. I'm, we're not talking about entrepreneurs. We're talking about in corporate America, um, working on their boards and different things. There's only three to 4% are uh, of those senior leaders are actually women. I happen to have made it in <laughs> and I've been lingering there for a minute, but my goal is that um, it's not because of a lack of talent, it's because of a lack of knowledge of what is desired in those positions. But middle manager, Karen, back in the days, that was my pain point because I had to go through a process of seeking someone out on LinkedIn um, you know, doing research, thinking someone asking them, will you be my mentor only, you know, and then I had that relationship. And so usually there is a personal connection and I like that to hear that for you. So you are a professor who teaches teachers as well from what the research that I've done, saw you kind of in your element, the pictures online and stuff. And I was like, you go girl power. Cause you know, I love that. So tell me about 
how do you keep teachers motivated? We know, I know because of my connection and watching my mom through the years that there is also a lot of administrative work that is required as a teacher as well. And I know a lot of teachers want to, they love the children, the students, you know, depending on what level you're teaching. How do you keep teachers motivated aside from the fact of the administrative requirements that are, and it's a requirement that are needed as part of their job? My main focus with ensuring that teachers are actually motivated, you have to ensure that they have buy-in. Um, also, what I, I use the acronym RESPECT. When it comes to administration, I feel that it is very important for, for the acronym for RESPECT. R is for recognition. That means that they need to recognize them for the experts that they are in the field. Equality is for the E. Shared ownership when it comes to in an inclusive setting for that general ed and that special ed teacher to have shared ownership for all students and ensuring that all students actually are able to excel. Paperwork is a key. That is a big, that's the big P for me. Paperwork. A lot of teachers are very overwhelmed. And so there, there comes a point in their life where they tend to become very overwhelmed to where they're not motivated to want to do their best. Um, and I know this per firsthand because, like I say, with my background in special education, along with my doctoral um, dissertation, was actually centered around what in the world could you do, Erica, to help these teachers? What could you possibly do? So I did a survey with the teachers at the school where I work and just to find out what, how can I help you? Because I want to ensure that I help you so you can definitely go out and teach these students. And they were like, um, we just need help with the paperwork. It's just so much. And we're just overwhelmed with paperwork. So what I in, in turn did because of that, I told them, I said, I do not have a problem being the LEA and the special education chairperson here at the school. I will take on all of those initials, all of those uh, reevaluation, all of the paperwork that goes with all of that. I will take on the, your caseload when it comes to that. And they were so appreciative, Dr. Karen, with just the fact that I took some of that pain off of them when it came time for completing the paperwork. And I'm going to go back to my respect because I know I got off. Um, the, the E stands for expectations, ensuring that the administrators have clear expectations for all teachers. The C is for collaborative efforts just ensuring that those teachers have the opportunity to sit down and to plan with their counterparts. That is essential. There's so many teachers out in the field and I've worked with various school districts around the state of Alabama where they don't have time to sit down and actually plan with their counterparts. They don't, their planning periods are not the same. They catch one another in the hallway to find out what's going on. That's not effective. And one person that, that really knows that that is not effective will be the students. When you're in there, you don't know exactly how to execute the lessons. And then um, the other one is actually teamwork, just ensuring that we are working as a team, not just within the classroom, but departmental wise as well, because we're all in this together. And I love acronyms because that help us remember, you know, um, things that we need to remember. So I love that. So let's talk about, you hear things about since the pandemic, the great resignation and um, teacher shortages and teachers leaving the classroom. Um, what, what do you think... Um, can help school districts maintain teachers in the industry? First and foremost, administrators 
because you'll notice that there's a breakdown when it comes to the building leaders, being in the classroom, seeing exactly what's going on, being supportive for all teachers. And, I, and I, I'm definitely a supporter of the fact that don't just go into the, the general ed classrooms and actually look and do observations, but you need to also go into the resource rooms as well, where the special ed teachers are. Ask them, what is it that, I, what can I do to help you be more effective at your job? Because the way that I look at it, we're all in there to get a job done, which is to educate all students. But a lot of times the special ed teachers do not have the necessary support from administration, whether it's with uh, classroom materials, supplies, and things of that nature, reading programs, math programs, um, once again, and this is something that I'm going to, I plan on talking on at the conference, my seven proven strategies that administrators can actually use and implement to address the shortage of special ed um, education teachers. I know that for me, one of my most difficult challenging times was my first year out um, teaching in the school system and I didn't have the support. I did not have a mentor. That is key. You have to have a mentor, someone that you can look up to that's, that's within that discipline that can help guide you um, based on the ins and outs with the special ed education process, all of the paper, paperwork, and then just what are your responsibilities and duties as a teacher. Talk to me about the power of collaboration among teachers based on uh, tiered instruction. Tell me a little bit about that. I, found, I have that written down here. Um, it was probably something before it and after it in my research review, but I, you know, I am for collaboration and partnerships, and I am also for incremental, incremental learning. So tell me about that. With um, collaboration, I, I feel it is very important because when you think about the different tiers, tiers of, of instruction, the tier one, tier two, and tier three, to me, every teacher, and that was something one, one of my professional development uh, sessions that I had a couple of weeks ago that I even told the general ed teachers, I said, when you think about it, there are special education curriculum guides. Now they're called differentiated um, instructional guides that are available for every at every state level where you can actually download resources to kind of help you um, with guiding your instruction. I think that a lot of the teachers, they, they struggle with the fact that they feel as if I can just give whole group instruction and not actually get into the actual small group. But in order to be an effective and, excuse me, an effective teacher and use um, best teaching strategies and things like that, they have to be able to differentiate their instruction. And I always tell the general ed teachers, I say, you're the content expert, but when it comes to the special ed teacher, they're the strategist. Both of them are like a marriage. We should be able to use both um, personnel in the classroom to ensure that we are tailoring these, these lessons based on how the kids learn best. I love that. I love that. Um, something else I want to talk about is students transitioning from high school to college. I know I saw something, you had a topic, the importance of education and transitioning to college life. Tell me about maybe some of the struggles that um, you know of that students um, experience making that transition to college life. First and foremost is being independent and being on their own. Um, they, they, they struggle with the fact that I have all of this free time. I'm able to pick my own schedule. I'm able, I'm not able, I don't have to go to class from 7.30 into 3.30 every day. I can make my own schedule, of course, with the, um, the actual guidance from my advisor. However, they, it's, it's like that level of freedom that really just kind of overwhelms them. Uh, also having that, holding them accountable, because I actually did a presentation with a group back during the spring on campus with one of my colleagues. And we were actually talking this, this, on this particular subject with some um, students from an, an 11th and 12th grade to just kind of get them acclimated. These are, the, these are the things that you're gonna experience once you arrive on campus, but you need to be held accountable and be responsible. And it's not, and in situation two, when you're transitioning to college, 
it's not where a lot of times where the professors will go out and seek you. You're having to, you need to seek help from them and, and also make use of the resources um, that we have on campus as it relates to tutor, tutorial services, um, the writing lab, because something that I have definitely noticed since the, the pandemic, COVID, and what have you, a lot of our students do, they actually lack the prerequisite skills in order for them to be successful in college. And one thing most definitely is the writing. And that was one area that I worked on with some eighth graders last week when I was in the field. I love that. Yes. And you're so, uh, you're so accurate. Even myself years ago, when I went to college and I was considered one of the smart ones, I ended up having to take one of those English, they call them, I call them a free credit class. It's not towards your, your degree, but it was so to get your skill set up to the, so you can take one of the one-on-one classes. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Yeah, true. <laughs> yes, and I was like, oh, I thought it was good in English. So yeah, you find out, and it's good to find out early. You know, yes. that's why all of those preliminary tests are very valuable so that you, because the whole goal is for you to succeed into college life. So I think the last thing I want to talk about before you let um, the leadership community know how they can stay in contact with you, anything that you got going on is data. I love data. I believe what you don't measure does not get done. I know data is needed and required and essential in every occupation, including education. And so I love that when I was doing my little research on you, uh, I saw something about teachers analyzing testing data. And I know we hear a lot about testing, testing, testing. Um, there are different names in different states, but they're pretty much the same thing. Um, it's these general tests that um, are responsible for deciding where the students should be and where they are. And so tell me about how important is analyzing data and test taking in the field of education? Data, data, data. When you think about it, it's your data that should drive your instruction. Teachers should not just actually go off of a pacing guide in order to teach the, the actual standards on a week to week basis. It's that data, whether it's informal or if it's some type of formal assessment that they give the students, or even like you mentioned, statewide assessment data at the end of the year. But it's that data that should drive their instruction. And it's, it's very important with when I was working with the teachers in the field, they actually brought to the actual session teacher made test. My purpose for having them actually bring the teacher made test to the actual session was actually to see if by chance your, your actual teacher made tests are actually measuring up based on the rigor, the content rigor for the standards. And what they found too, um, Dr. Karen, you would be amazed. They were like, you know what, Dr. Sheffield, I'm, I'm just too embarrassed to even share with you at what depth of knowledge my question stems were on this particular test. And I told them it's okay. It is a learning process for everyone. So um, from analyzing their actual tests, some of them actually discovered that, ooh, I'm still at DOK level one, where it's more recall types of questions. I'm not digging really deep where I'm having the students analyze or be able to compare and contrast and things of that nature, synthesize and things of that nature. So with that first session, they were like, okay, this is where they actually performed. And I had them look at their percentages based on each one of those uh, depth of knowledge levels. And I was like, we really need to ensure that these students are, at, are functioning at DOK levels three and four. They were like, okay. They, say, they, they told me before they actually left the session, you got me this time on this first session, but you won't get me no more. I was like, all right now. So I'm telling you right now, I am coming back every, and they know that I come back every month because that's the way that the administrator has it set up. And I told them that the purpose for that is to see exactly if you're making strides and you're making growth based on your instruction and your rigor. And there's one teacher that was there. She told me, she said, Oh my gosh, she said, but I actually do that in the classroom. I said, well, let me just tell you this, whatever you have the students accustomed to 
completing in your classroom, it should be seen at the end of the week when you actually assess them on their tests. At that same type of, of, of um, format that you use on an everyday basis should actually be replicated on your test. And she was like, oh, well, okay, I got it now. So yes, data is there to drive your instruction. I even, with my professional development uh, sessions, I have the teachers that are involved complete surveys because I use that data for my business to ensure that I'm on track. And if I'm not on track, what do I need to do to get back on track to ensure that I'm giving them what they need? I love that you love education. It comes out when you're speaking, your passion comes out because I do truly believe that those who we interact with in our line of business can tell, can tell that this is something that we're passionate about something that we're committed to. And so I love that your whole, your nonverbals and your verbals match. Love that, love that, love that. So why don't you share with the leadership community anything that you got going on, books, workshops. Um, we know that you're going to be at the 2022 Sister Leaders Conference and they'll be seeing you around because there's going to be some visibility opportunities coming up as well. But you got other things going on in addition to sister leaders. And so share with them all that you want to share and then make sure that you share with them how they can stay connected and on what social media platform you want them to stay connected or get connected with you on. The way that they can get in contact with me, of course, is through my Facebook. Uh, it's called um, Anchor to Teach. Um, and also my website is anchortoteach.com. I also have um, drericaspeaks.com. That's um, more of my motivational um, speaker website for empowering women. So those are my two outlets that I do have. My email address is info at anchor2, that's with the number two, teach.com. So that's how they can get in contact with me. I love that. And my team will make sure that that scrolls around the down the bottom um, as you speak so that those who uh, may want to take a screenshot can take a screenshot if they're multitasking. I love highlighting sister leaders doing their thing um, in various industries. And so I appreciate you coming on and sharing your passion and your knowledge with the Leadership and Serve community. Um, and as you know, community, I have the sun that's coming into the studio right now. So if I look like I'm on fire, just don't even pay it any mind. I can't even can't even reach the window. The window is so high, um, but the sun is coming into the studio. But the Leadership is Serve shows and airs in over 200 countries. We are on all forms of digital. We're on Amazon Fire, Google Play, Roku, Samsung TV, LG G TV. And so you will get more information, Dr. Erica, on how you can share this with your community as well as you'll get your own copy. And so I thank you so much. And this has been another episode of Leadership is Served. Bye. <laughs>